And so right now we're going to talk about controlling cholesterol naturally. Controlling cholesterol naturally. Now first of all, or I should say last of all, I'm at the end of the slideshow. All right. So now we'll start with controlling cholesterol naturally. Now, first of all, cholesterol is defined as a waxy, fatty alcohol. You go look it up, it's a waxy, fatty alcohol. But a lot of people don't realize that cholesterol is actually very important and you need it, right? Cholesterol is not bad. Cholesterol is very good. And you need it inside your, the membranes of your cells so that those membranes can move. If you didn't have cholesterol in the membranes of your cells, you would be kind of like a breaking plant when you try to move around. It wouldn't work so well. And not only does it help you move, but it helps you to form uh, many different hormones, like uh, reproductive hormones and adrenal hormones. It's involved in the production of, or the, the, it's a precursor to vitamin D. Sunshine exposure to cholesterol then starts developing vitamin D. Um, it's also involved in the production of bile. Cholesterol is involved in the transportation of molecules inside your cells. Uh, this is really interesting. When you get down into the microstructure of the, the cells and all that stuff that's going along in there, you see that there's this big blob and it has kind of legs underneath it. There's motor proteins inside the cell and they actually walk along. And they carry, they carry molecules and there's a whole address system within the cells and they know exactly where to carry the, set, the stuff to and where to deposit it and drop it off. Oh, it's quite interesting. But anyway, so cholesterol is involved in some of that process. It's involved in, in getting signals from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell so that the cell knows how to react to its environment. It's involved in nerve conduction and so thinking and motor action and so on and so forth like that. Uh, you like cholesterol to be in your white blood cells because your white blood cells need to get the bad guys and eat them up. Phagocytosis. In that eating up process, you need cholesterol in order to be able to do it. And um, your liver is the greatest producer of cholesterol. It produces about 20% of the cholesterol in your body. Most every tissue in your body produces some cholesterol. Some of the other organs that are high producers are things like the intestines, the adrenal glands, and the reproductive organs. So it's not just the liver. Liver is only about 20%. And it's estimated that a, a, a male who weighs about 150 pounds produces about 1,000 milligrams of cholesterol a day. That's not that you're eating it. That's just that you're producing it. The cells are making that much. And you have somewhere around 35,000 milligrams of cholesterol in your body. Most of it is within those cell membranes. And not, when you eat food that contains cholesterol in it, you don't absorb all of it. In fact, it varies. Some as low as 15% of the cholesterol you absorb, and at other times it's up to 75%. Um, so if the body's really in need of it, then it'll absorb more, and if it doesn't need much of it, it doesn't uh, absorb as much. And you have this interesting thing called the enterohepatic circulation. Entero meaning intestines, hepatic meaning liver, and the liver, of course, produces bile, and if you've ever had any bad vomiting, you know what bile is. It's green, it doesn't taste very good, and it's, it's, very, it's much better when it goes the other direction than coming back up. Right? Um, <clears throat> bile actually makes the stool brown. If you didn't have it, then it would be kind of a white color. Um, and, uh, and anyway, so the bile gets stored there in the gallbladder and it helps to break down fats into smaller pieces so that the fatty enzymes, the digestive enzymes for fats, can really do its digestion process. Well, when the bile gets uh, released into the first part of the intestine, it goes traveling along through the rest of the small intestine, and when it gets to the last part of the small intestine, the first part of the colon, it gets reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. And that bile 
goes back to the liver, the liver captures it again and re-utilizes it in forming more bile. And it's a very efficient system. You reabsorb about 95% of the bile, which is mostly made of cholesterol, that you excreted into the digestive tract. Why are we talking about this now? Well, because later when we talk about what do you do about high cholesterol, we're going to utilize this. Right? Now, not only do you, uh, do you change how you absorb cholesterol based upon what you need, the cells also change how they produce cholesterol. So if you're in need, the cells can increase their production of cholesterol, and if you're not in so much need, then they can decrease their production of cholesterol to try to maintain a balance. Because again, cholesterol is good, but too much cholesterol is not good. And so what is ideal as far as cholesterol? If you go to your doctor and you get some blood work done and you do a cholesterol profile, what are you supposed to be looking at? Well, I am going to differ with many of your providers. Um, your providers, the, 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 the guidelines will say that cholesterol is normal all the way up to 199, the total cholesterol. And then once you hit 200, then it's a high level. Well, 35% of people who have heart attacks have cholesterol between 150 and 199. Do you want to be part of 35% of people with heart attacks? No, right? Normal is not protective. Protective in some major study shows that you have to have a total cholesterol level below 150, and when it's below 150, no fatal heart attacks. That's the protective range, and so that's ideally where you want to be, total cholesterol below 150. Now, to total cholesterol is made up of triglycerides. That's part of it. And the triglycerides are the storage form of fat that gets in the fat cells and then can get broken down and made sugar so that you can have energy from it. And ideally, the triglycerides should be below 100. Now, your laboratory will probably say that normal is up to 150. Then if it's beyond that, then it's high, but that's really not ideal. It really should be below 100 if you want to be really healthy. Now, the HDL, which is your good cholesterol, it should be probably 60 or more uh, if you're looking at ideal. Sometimes when your total cholesterol is pretty low, the HDL is going to be pretty low as well, and that's okay. Right? But if you could have a higher HDL, that would be great. Well, what do you do to get a higher HDL? Exercise helps to increase your HDL, your good cholesterol. And nuts help to increase your, your good cholesterol the HDL. Those are a couple of things that help, but don't go nuts over the nuts. Then it starts increasing the bad cholesterol too when you get too much of it and so on. And then your LDL, which is your good, I mean your bad cholesterol, that ideally you want to keep that below 70. That's really the protective range. So the lab will say below 100 is fine. Some labs will even say below 130 is fine. And I just scratch my head and go, whoa, what are we doing? Um, so so these are the ranges that you really want to have as far as ideal um, to, get the, uh, to get the blood, I mean, the, the cholesterol levels. Now, you and I know that water and oil don't mix. Right? And cholesterol is a fat. But blood is water. So how are you going to get the fat to mix with the water? You can't. So what do you have to do? You have to package it. So what happens is the body wraps those fats in a blanket which has a type of carbohydrate on one side called glycerol, and glycerol likes water. And on the other side of that blanket, it has fatty tails, and the fatty tails like the fat. So you get this blanket that you wrap around the, the uh, cholesterol, and that thing then goes floating through the bloodstream to carry it from one location to another. 
And you have ones that are very big, like very low density lipoprotein, VLDL. And then you have ones that are kind of smaller, they're intermi intermittent density lipoproteins. And then you have ones that are smaller, they're your LDL, the lo low density lipoprotein, and those are broken down even to large buoyant or small dense LDLs. The smaller it gets on this side, where they have this ApoB protein on the, on the surface, the smaller they get, the more dangerous they are. Right? Small dense LDL is really bad at getting deposited in the arteries and forming plaques and so on and so forth. But then on the other side, you have this other guy called HDL, high density lipoprotein. He's even smaller, but he's not dangerous. He's a good guy because he has this ApoA1 uh, protein on the surface. And it's pri primarily responsible of, of for taking cholesterol from the body, from the arteries, from other locations, and bringing it back to the liver so that the liver can break it down and, and process it and, you know, make bile and other types of things like that. Whereas these guys over here, they take cholesterol from the liver, from your diet and the things that you have eaten or what the liver made, and then it carries it to the body to be deposited somewhere, and heaven forbid it gets deposited in your arteries. Now, what happens in that artery process? You have white blood cells. Anybody like white blood cells? Yeah? Some of us aren't sure. White blood cells are good. And they're kind of like the policemen, and they, they get the bad guys. Well, if you have too much cholesterol around, some of the, sometimes the policemen uh, incarcerate too many uh, cholesterol molecules, and they're driving them around. And, and they have, they're called foam cells because they have so much cholesterol inside of them. And then there's this emergency signal on the side of the artery, this SOS signal, and the policemen go, hang on, I need to take care of this. And so they go and they go into the wall of the artery to try to take care of what's going on. They get in a fight with the bad guys and guess what? Some of the white blood cells die. But they had the cholesterol in them. So what did they leave behind? The cholesterol, that's right. So the cholesterol gets stuck there. But the fight's not over. And so more white blood cells come, and they had cholesterol in them as well. And so they go there, and they die, and they leave the cholesterol behind, and so on and so forth. And now you start getting this developing plaque. And when that plaque starts getting bigger and bigger, then the inside of the artery, where the blood can go through, gets smaller and smaller. And so blood doesn't flow quite so well. And if it gets so small that the blood doesn't flow, and that's one of the blood vessels uh, feeding your brain, well, then there's a stroke. Or if it's feeding the heart, then there's a heart attack. Or if it's feeding the kidney, then you get renal ischemia and then kidney damage and so on and so forth. Or if it's going to your legs, then, then you have this painful thing called claudication. You walk a certain distance and then it gets achy and and, oh, oh, and then you rest, and it gets better. And then you walk that distance again, and it gets all achy, and oh, it's kind of like having a small heart attack in your leg. Right? Uh, so none of those are good. You don't want any of those. Right? And, and yeah, we already covered that about the smaller ones. Smaller ones are more dangerous. Now, not only can you have this situation where the cholesterol can develop and the plaque gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and the lumen gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but you can have a case where, where there's some cholesterol plaque and it's, yeah, it's there, but it's not so big, but it pops open. And then there's a blood clot. And you get no blood flow down from that. That's not good. Right? Damage happens associated with it. So the plaque can rupture and form a blood clot blocking that blood flow. Now what does that? Well, hmm. We know that the cholesterol concentration in the blood increases significantly minutes after a meal that contains cholesterol. And, and that can remain elevated for about seven hours after that high cholesterol meal. And interestingly enough, even though cholesterol is a waxy, fatty alcohol, if you super concentrate it, it becomes a pokey crystal. Okay. Does that look like it'd be fun to sit on? 
No, not at all. Nice little pokey spikes and spines sticking out all over the place. So when you super concentrate cholesterol, it turns into a crystal. And so let's say that you go to the Heart Attack Cafe. There, it exists. And I'm, you notice that he's wearing a hospital gown. That's part of your experience of going to the, to the Heart Attack Cafe. You get a hospital gown, and you get to eat all of your cholesterol burger and whatever that you want to. Anyway, so you go to the cholesterol, you go to the Heart Attack Cafe, and you have this big cholesterol meal. And now the cholesterol concentration in your bloodstream increases. And, 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 and then, you know, you got to put it somewhere, and so some of it starts being put in that plaque that you have in the artery. Well, the plaque was already fairly full, but you're trying to jam more in there. Well, now it becomes super concentrated, and in a super concentration, it starts forming a crystal, and those spikes start coming out, and the spikes poke through the inside lining of the artery. And now you develop a blood clot. And the blood clot stops the blood flow going wherever it was, to the brain, to the heart, to the kidneys, to the wherever, and then you have some kind of adverse effect associated with it. So where do you find cholesterol? Animals. That's right. It's found in animals. Cattle, fish, poultry, anything else that moves or lives on its own. If it can run, swim, or fly away from you, if you try to kill it and eat it, it has cholesterol. If it has a face or a mother, it has cholesterol. If it falls out of something that could run, swim, or fly away from you if you try to kill it and eat it, or squirts out of something that could do that, then it has cholesterol as well. So now dairy products and eggs and so on. A medium-sized egg has about 220 milligrams of cholesterol. The single food item in the United States that provides the greatest cholesterol content to Americans. Anybody know what it is? Cheese, that's right. Cheese, cheese is the single item that provides the most cholesterol in the American diet. So, if we are going to overcome high cholesterol, and it really is a problem, it's a challenge, and we must, we must uh, do well from this standpoint, how are we going to overcome high cholesterol? Statin medications, of course, right? Eat bad, pop a pill, get better. No? No? Not convinced? All right, good. Stop eating cholesterol. That could be like the end of the, uh, the, end of the program, right? Stop eating cholesterol, right? Uh, don't eat it. Your body produces it. It produces all you need. You don't have to eat it. So don't eat it. And so stop eating animals and their byproducts. You won't get cholesterol in your diet because that's where you find it. All right, so let's go a little bit farther than that. That's a simple thing. Well, what do you eat if you don't eat it? Eat plants. Plants are good, right? Plants are good for you. Guess what plants have that animals don't? Fiber. That's right. Plants have fiber that animals don't have. And um, remember we talked about this thing with the liver and the intestines, and you have this enterohepatic circulation, and you know, it releases the bile, but it absorbs about 95% of it back, and so on. Guess what fiber does? Fiber binds to the bile. And guess what fiber doesn't do? Fiber doesn't get absorbed. right? So if the bile binds to the fiber and the fiber doesn't get absorbed, what happens to the bile, which is made up of cholesterol? It just moseys on its way and finds itself in a bath. And then you, you, you know, it's gone, right? Um, <clears throat> so it, it travels on through. So the more fiber that you have in your diet, the more you bind cholesterol in the form of bile in the bowel, and the less of it you absorb. And even if you have a diet that is, does not have any cholesterol in it at all, 
right? Let's say that you're on a completely plant-based diet, but your, your cholesterol levels are still high. Increased fiber still helps because you're still producing bile, and bile is made predominantly of cholesterol. So it will bind that bile, and instead of having an efficient 95% reabsorption, you decrease that efficiency and you lose more cholesterol in the toilet. Right? So that's another thing that you can do. That's step two. Step three, avoid fried or high-fat foods. Right? It may not be cholesterol in and of itself. But we know that if you have a diet that includes trans fats in it, and trans, I, I don't have time to go through the molecular structure of that. In fact, I think in your printout you have a few that show uh, some of that molecular structure that we didn't cover tonight. Um, but but uh, trans fats are not natural. And the body does not recognize it as natural. And when you have those trans fats, it increases inflammation, but it also increases the bad cholesterol and decreases the good cholesterol, and overall increases your total cholesterol. Uh, but it's not a cholesterol itself. But it affects cholesterol metabolism. And when you get, take fats and you increase their heat and their temperature over a prolonged period of time, then you force them into a trans configuration, so they become a trans fat, um, and, uh, and you can have problems from that standpoint. And, uh, and, and some, uh, some of the, the oils are more susceptible to that transformation into a trans fat than others are. Like everybody knows olive oil is a good oil, but it's a monounsaturated fat, and so it's very heat, heat labile. And so when you heat it up and you cook with it, uh, there's a lot of transformation into a trans fat uh, associated with it. Coconut oil, it's a saturated fat. So people are kind of, you know, they're a little bit leery about it because saturated, we know saturated fats aren't so good. But saturated fats are very heat stable. And so you can increase their temperature and you can keep it hot for a while and there's, there's really not a transformation associated with it. Um, and, and so they're a bit more heat stable. Now I'm not saying eat coconut oil and don't eat olive oil. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, if you have high cholesterol, what I'd be saying is don't eat either of them. You don't need them. Eat coconuts and eat olives. It's better for you than coconut oil and olive oil. But avoid the fried foods and avoid the high fat foods because your liver and your cells are going to use that fat as a basis to make its cholesterol from, and the more of it you eat, the more cholesterol you're going to produce, even though you're not eating any cholesterol. Right? So that will also help you. Also, the study, the research shows that individuals who include nuts, a small amount of nuts on a regular basis, actually have lower cholesterol levels. They have less heart disease as well. Uh, studies coming through uh, the Adventist Health Studies out of Loma Linda, uh, the Harvard Health Professional Study, and, uh, and uh, Harvard and so on, they're, they're confirming that, yeah, less heart disease from individuals who eat nuts on a regular basis. And that was shocking back in the 1980s, late, uh, early 1990s when they started getting that data. Because they're thinking, well, you know, nuts are high in fat. And so it, they can't be healthy for, for the body and so on and so forth. No, they are. But don't overdo it. Don't go nuts about nuts. Right? If you go nuts about nuts, then it's going to cause problems. And in fact, one of the areas, if you're on a plant-based diet and, and you're doing most everything that you know to do, but your cholesterol levels are still high, this is one of the areas that might be your problem. Too much nuts. Right? So how, many, how much nuts are you supposed to have? And which ones are the best? Well, I can't say necessarily who, who's the best. The most research has been done with black walnuts. But there's good research with pecans. There's good research with almonds as well. Cashews don't tend to perform as well. Um, and peanuts don't tend to perform as well either um, <clears throat> from that standpoint. But uh, how much nuts? Well, in some of the studies, they say about 100 grams which is about three and a half ounces, so you're looking at a handful. And a handful of nuts for the day. And preferably, if it's raw or dry roasted or something like that, depending on the nuts, some of the nuts you don't want them particularly raw. Um, but not like oil roasted and so on. All right, step number four. Well, avoid processed carbohydrates. I know, I just heard that. Avoid high processed high, high, uh, carbohydrates. You looked at that and you went, oh, look at that, that's yummy. 
It is. It tastes good. I'll kill you. <laughs> right? Um, the processed carbohydrates like this, your pastries and cookies and other, pie, other, other things like that, they're usually fairly high in trans fats. They do have a fairly high fat content. And uh, that, again, will push uh, the increased levels of, of uh, bad cholesterol and so on. Um, and it will not, be, we, will not be helping you significantly from that standpoint. Now, step number five. Avoid oils, right? If, now, I, I don't mean that you necessarily have to avoid all oils all the time. But if you have gone through steps number one, two, three, and four, and you've been doing those consistently, and your cholesterol levels are still high and you can't get them under control, then we got to start looking at the oils. Because any oil, I don't care what kind it is, it's coconut oil and almond oil and uh, you know, avocado oil and, and, and olive oil and so on and so forth. I don't care what kind of oil it is. Any oil that is separated from the product that it came from becomes pro-inflammatory. Right? So it increases inflammation and increases oxidative stress in the body, which is one reason why you like to have antioxidants to counterbalance that or to counterwork it. Um, and, uh, and so it's not as good as the product that it came from. Right? So it's better to eat olives than it is to have olive oil. It's better to eat coconuts than it is to have coconut oil. It's better to eat the avocados than it is to have avocado oil and so on and so forth. Right? Because there's so many, I mean, there are thousands of phytonutrients that go along with it. There's lots of fiber and so on that's associated with it. It's not just the oil, but when you extract the oil, you lose all of that other good beneficial stuff that you had there. So if you've done steps one through four, cholesterol's still high, I'm recommending let's cut out the oils. Right? Let's just cut them out. You can get some, you know, you can saute with water and herbs and make it taste really good. And, you know, there's ways of working around it. Taste buds that can change over time. Taste buds, by the way, change about every 30 days. Right? It takes about that long for them to, to replace themselves. And so when you, when you change the way that you eat and you stick with it for about 30 days, you get used to it. As long as you're not perverting it in between. <laughs> right? If you go back to the bad stuff and so on in between, then you, you're retraining the new taste buds with the bad stuff. And you know, you got to wait longer. It makes it, makes it harder. And then, of course, too many nuts like we talked about as well. All right, step number six. Well, there are foods or supplements that have been shown to be beneficial in lowering cholesterol. And so using some of these foods or these, uh, these supplements, one of those is barley. That's not a magic bullet, but barley works. Barley, there's, there's a number of studies looking at barley and its effect upon cholesterol. And individuals who consistently eat barley in their diets, it helps to decrease cholesterol levels. And uh, more so than some of the other grains. Why is it the case? I'm not sure. But it works. And, you know, barley doesn't taste bad. Then there's uh, niacin, vitamin B3. Um, in fact, niacin can be used as a medication for high cholesterol, and it particularly has an effect upon triglycerides, but it can affect the total cholesterol and, and, and the other cholesterols as well. Um, and then it's in higher doses if, it's, if you take it in high doses, you know, 500 milligrams up to 2,000. Uh, people, it has side effects associated with it, like your face turns red. <sighs> And uh, anybody who's ever had a personal summer, you know what the, you know, hot flash? Right. <clears throat> um, if anybody's ever experienced uh, hot flashes, uh, you know that they're very uncomfortable and you don't like them. I have never experienced a hot flash, I will just say. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I just, uh, I have been around women who have, and so by association, I have understood that they're not comfortable and so on and so forth. And, uh, some are more vocal about it than others. Um, <laughs> but niacin will do that. It'll cause hot flashes. Not real hot flashes, but causes the blood vessels to dilate. 
and you get this profound dilation of the blood vessels and your face turns red and, and it feels kind of uncomfortable. So some individuals will use like a, a, a delayed release niacin form. So it gets into the bloodstream and it increases it, but not so fast. And so you have less of a response. And if you use it um, over, a, over a more prolonged period of time, then the body kind of adjusts to it some. Uh, but B3 can be helpful from that standpoint. Blonde psyllium. Right, just psyllium, psyllium husk. Um, it, it's a lot of fiber, and again, it's going to bind more, more bile in the, in the digestive tract. You're going to get rid of more of it in the toilet, and so cholesterol levels tend to come down. Oats, well, hey, mix some barley and oats together. Both of those have been shown to help to decrease cholesterol levels. It works pretty good. Red yeast rice. Um, red yeast rice is actually where they got statin medications from. Um, and uh, it's been used in uh, oriental locations for quite a, quite a long time. They figured out that there was a substance in there. I believe it was lovastatin. Um, I think that was the one. And um, that was in there, and then they, they, be, they were able to identify it and, and sequence it and so on and so forth, and then make medication out of it in billions of dollars. Uh, but red yeast rice is also something that individuals could use, and uh, that's it right down there in the lower corner. It really is red. Uh, Beta-glucans. Beta-glucans, what's that? Well, beta-glucans comes from things like whole grains, mushrooms, and uh, dates are good sources of beta-glucans. Um, and, uh, and they are... What should I say? They are, uh, it's, yeah. Anyways, they are chemical uh, um, products that you find in the plants that, that help to start then decreasing the cholesterol levels and sometimes competing with the cholesterol receptors uh, so that you don't have as much uh, absorption of it. Beta cytosterol as well. That you have in high sources in avocado and in nuts and in beans. And so avocados, nuts, and beans are a fairly good source of beta cytosterol. Uh, that helps to, um, to decrease cholesterol levels as well. And then there's cytostanol, um, which is prominent in soy and in nuts. And so soy, soy, soybeans, soy products, and nuts are a fairly good source of cytostanol. Uh, it's a phytosterol, and I'm not going to say much about that because that comes to our next slide. Uh, instead of steps number six, we have step number seven. It says eat plant phytosterols. What's a phytosterol? Phyto um, has to do with a plant source chemical. Sterol means that it's a cholesterol. So this is a plant-based cholesterol. Do plants have cholesterol? No. But they have substances that are similar to cholesterol. But guess what? <clears throat> the plant phytosterols that you find again in avocado flax, peanuts, and that kind of stuff. They compete with cholesterol for reabsorption in the GI tract. And so there's, a, there's only a certain number of transporters that can get that cholesterol, reabsorb it back into the bloodstream, and the phytosterols start competing with it for that so that you get less of the cholesterol that gets reabsorbed and you get more of the plant phytosterols that gets absorbed, but then what happens? Well, those absorbed plant phytosterols typically are excreted back into the GI tract, right? And so it gets absorbed, but it gets kicked back out. And, uh, and so in, in that way uh, is part of the mechanism by which it helps to decrease uh, cholesterol levels in individuals. And so you got cholesterol issues, well, it's not a bad idea to eat avocado, just Again, don't go nuts over the avocado. Flax, ooh, there are so many benefits associated with flax. Flax is really good. Flaxseed is, is great. Um, and best usually if you freshly grind it before you use it. How much do you use? Depends on what you're doing, but usually about two tablespoons a day. Uh, just mix it in with your food. Uh, some people throw them in smoothies or whatever. Um, Omega-3 uh, fatty acids is fairly high concentration in in one study, oh, I'm getting to the high blood pressure lecture tomorrow. Anyways, uh, in one study, flax was the single food item that had the greatest reduction in blood pressure. 
Um, and so from a blood pressure standpoint, Flax does a, a very good job, but it takes time. It takes a few months before you start seeing the blood pressure decreasing, and then you hit your maximum of about six months. Um, and it's about as good as a blood pressure medication that could be approved by the FDA for use. Right. But nobody's going to make money off of Flax, so let's look for something else. Uh, step number eight. Exercise, exercise, let us get our exercise, right? Exercise is very good as far as cholesterol is concerned. Again, exercise will increase your good cholesterol. It will decrease your bad cholesterol. It will bring your total cholesterol levels down, right? So it's very beneficial from that standpoint. And it's beneficial whether you are young or whether you just think you're young. But you know, don't they say you are what you think? So we're all young in here, right? That's right. That's right. Um, I think she is 104. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, has a daily routine of exercise and walking. She still has a license and drives. Um, and... Uh, um, doing quite well, you know. Exercise is a good portion, you know, good part of the part of the um, plan. And if you don't exercise, you might just blow up. Yes. <laughs> so uh, step nine has to do with stress. Um, anybody know what stress is by experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. Uh, there is this entity called stress-induced hypercholesterolemia. So what it is, is you have stress, and the stress affects the cells of the body, and the cells of the body increase their production of cholesterol, and your cholesterol levels go up just because of the stress. Now stress, it will affect you in a number of different ways. One of the ways that it can affect you is through glucocorticoid uh, glucocorticoid receptors. These are steroid receptors, natural steroid receptors, uh, that respond to hormones from the, from the adrenal glands. And, uh, and over time, when you have stress over a prolonged period of time, it messes up those receptors. You have fewer of them. They become down-regulated. And so you have an abnormal response to, uh, to situations, and you have uh, increased stress. Well, those glucocorticoid receptors are also involved in this whole process of uh, fat metabolism and cholesterol and so on and so forth. And so, yes, stress itself can increase your cholesterol levels. And so it's important to get that under control. How do you get stress under control? Come tomorrow. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. That's right. Um, so uh, there's many things that can help out with the, with the stress. And I'll just say as you go down the acronym, it gets really good at the end. Right. Uh, trust. Trust uh, it really is a, a remedy for stress. Um, but then the question is, who can you trust and what can you trust? Again, we'll talk about that tomorrow. So when we look at this whole land of high cholesterol and high cholesterol levels and so on and so forth, and what do we do about it? Number one, step one, stop eating animals and their byproducts. Number two, we want to stop eating a diet high in, I mean, we want to start eating a diet high in fiber, right? Because that's going to bind it. Number three, we want to avoid fried or high fat foods because those are going to promote then the increased production of cholesterol from your own cells, even if you're not eating cholesterol and it's not in your diet. Number four, your step four, you want to avoid processed carbohydrates. They tend to be high in trans fats, uh, and, uh, and they also promote the uh, production of uh, LDL, bad cholesterol. Uh, number five, you want to avoid oils and too many nuts. Uh, if one through four, is uh, still not taking care of it, then number five kicks in place. Right? Some individuals, your cholesterol levels, you can, there's some individuals you can eat like really bad, and your cholesterol levels are really good. I have to get you on some other point, right? 
I mean, even eating really bad, even though the cholesterol is really good, is still really bad. Um, but I can't jump on the on the cholesterol part of it because you manage it well. So uh, maybe they absorb less cholesterol that they eat. The, the cells are able to downregulate their production of cholesterol and so on and so forth, and so still manages it quite well. Uh, number six, eat cholesterol-lowering foods. Right? Cholesterol-lowering foods. Uh, again, like the barley and the oats and, and, and the cholesterol-lowering supplements as well, like the niacin, uh, that can be beneficial, red yeast rice. Uh, number seven, you want to eat plant phytosterols. And avocado, peanuts um, are some good sources for uh, plant phytosterols, uh, those plant-based uh, cholesterol-like molecules. Number eight, exercise till you're 104, and then exercise more. <laughs> right? Exercise helps out with that. And then number nine, eliminating stress. And uh, those are ways that you can naturally go about uh, uh, helping out with your cholesterol levels. Now, we currently have a session at our Lifestyle Center, and so we have guests that are with us now. And um, we have a guest that's with us, and of course I can't give any names or any identifying information, but this individual has a really good exercise pattern, and, and uh, their diet is pretty good, and, and they really have, they appear to have stress really well under control, and so on and so forth. And I'm running through this whole list, and I'm, I'm kind of running out of things to recommend to them, and their cholesterol level is still high. It happens. It's rare. But it happens still. Somebody, and they're, you know, they don't want anything to do with statin medications because they've had complications associated with it, and they know that there's all sorts of effects. You know, there's uh, increased falls and weakness, and, and uh, there's a question of, of association with cancer and a number of different things with statin medications. The question that I don't have research for in that situation to be able to answer is, what is my risk? If I'm doing all the healthy stuff and my cholesterol levels are still high, what is my risk for plaque development and all, and uh, you know, heart attack and stroke and all the complications associated with high cholesterol? The answer is, I don't know. I don't know. But I think, my opinion is, is that your risk for all of the complications associated with it is going to be less than somebody who has high cholesterol because they have the bad health habits, right? And so I'm interested to follow up on their case and see how they do over time and see whether they ever have any complications associated with it or whether they don't. I just don't know, right? Now that being said, do you have any questions about what we've covered tonight or what we haven't covered tonight. Yes. Have you ever used um, medicinal herbs like moringa in your tests with, uh, you know, the different cases with clients? All right, so have we used different herbs like moringa um, with our different uh, patients? Uh huh. Yeah, medicinal herbs. Yes, we do. Um, uh, in fact, one of the uh, I don't know where the herb slide ran off to. One of the herbs that's also known to help with, um, I don't know if you call it an herb, it's a tree resin. It's called Google, G-U-G-G-U-L. Um, and uh, it tastes horrible, but it works to help to decrease the cholesterol levels. And so yes, we will use that. Um, and, uh, and also there are some, some uh, supplements as well, like coenzyme Q10. Uh, that tends to be helpful as well with cardiovascular health, um, not necessarily in lowering cholesterol, but out, but uh, helping with the with the risks associated with cardiovascular disease. Uh, that's beneficial um, when we have individuals that heart, have heart disease. We're also thinking of things like hawthorn. Hawthorn berry uh, tends to be beneficial as well. Uh, if there's heart rate issues associated with it, then motherwort uh, tends to be, be uh, beneficial. Sometimes bugleweed. Uh, there's a number of herbs that are uh, that are beneficial, and so yes, we do we do use medicinal herbs, and we have in our center a tea room. Good. I bet you had the hibiscus, the sorrel. 
Uh, and yes, uh -huh. yes. Yeah, hibiscus is great for high blood pressure. Yes, it um, it's uh, one of the one of the herbs that uh, has some good science behind it with blood pressure reduction. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, so we, when you go into the tea room, you open up the doors, and there's a bunch of mason jars with all sorts of different teas, all in alphabetical order, and then the next drawers, and I mean the next cabinets, and it's all there in the next cabinets, and it's all there in the next cabinets, and the next ones, and so on. And so we've got, we've got lots of different herbs there that we use, um, along with the, um, the, the other healthy lifestyle remedies that we use as well. Let me ask one question for you. Mm -hmm. Most of our herbs that we're using uh, with the tea room, it's dry. dry. So it's the dry and it's the powders or it's the cut and sift or um, uh, whatever from that standpoint. We do have, um, we do use, uh, you know, a lot of different plants uh, in regards to the diet. Um, and, uh, you know, for some individuals, then we're juicing or smoothies um, and then raw, uh, raw diets for some, or at least for a period of time, or a 60, I mean an 80% or a 70% raw um, that we use as well. We don't have any Moringa uh, trees on campus. Um, <clears throat> I know, I know, I know. Moringa is... I have like, ooh, yeah. I like 50 trees, you do, okay. Uh -huh. and, um, but I know Moringa has a lot of uh, good benefits associated with it. Um, and uh, there was a, a lot of individuals that were utilizing it when we were in Trinidad. We lived in Trinidad and Tobago for two and a half years and, and, uh, and visiting Jamaica. I know a lot of people use it there and, and uh, Bahamas they use it as well. And, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, herbs that have a lot of uh, good benefits associated with them. Some of them we'll talk about on Sunday when we talk about kitchen cabinet remedies, but it'll be the ones that are more common that you find in your, in your cabinet um, <clears throat> that we'll be talking about. Um, we could do a whole thing on herbs. We have, we have a seminar that we do at Uchi Pines uh, in the last full week of March, and that one is, uh, you know, you have health lectures like this in the morning. In the afternoon, you have hands-on tracks. And uh, this last time we had, um, you know, a, a good master herbalist that was there and talking about the different herbs and how you make the different preparations and actually going through and doing the preparations and so on and so forth. And then we had a hydrotherapy track and a, a vegan cooking track and we had an agriculture track as well for, um, for individuals as well and uh, to get some of that uh, hands-on experience. So, yeah. Other questions? So right. how do you know if you're getting something that's potent and something that's actually good for you and not harmful to you? Yeah, <clears throat> that, uh, very good questions, very good questions. Um, it, when, first of all, when we look at vitamins, you know, we'll take that and then we'll talk about supplements um, uh, specifically in, in just a little bit. When, we, when you look at vitamins, um, the, the, the research, the literature is not very, um, what should I say, it's not very strong uh, when it comes to vitamins and vitamin supplementation. Uh, in large uh, reviews of looking at literature and pulling bunches of studies together and the effects of um, multivitamin use uh, in individuals, they're finding no longevity benefit associated with it, uh, not really much of a change in uh, disease states and so on and so forth for individuals that are taking multivitamins versus those that are not, and even when they're doing so over a prolonged a year's time, uh, that they're that they're supplementing with vitamins, um, and uh, there are still individuals that purport that um, or that support that if you do high dose of certain vitamins then that is going to help out with certain situations or certain cases, and that may be. There is uh, research with uh, like vitamin C 
um, an intravenous vitamin C and high dose intravenous vitamin C and uh, its an impact upon kidney failure uh, and helping to decrease kidney failure rates. There is an intensive, uh, an intensive care specialist in Ohio, I believe that it is, uh, that has integrated using IV vitamin C as part of their treatment for sepsis. Um, for individuals that are treating them in their ICU, and they're finding significantly greater rates of survival from sepsis for individuals that include I IV vitamin C as part of the treatment protocol, as opposed to those who are using the rest of the normal treatment protocol with all the antibiotics and so on and so forth. Now, it, they're doing all the antibiotics and all of that too, but then they're adding the vitamin C to it. Uh, and so there's some cases where it looks like uh, maybe high doses used in specific situations might be beneficial. We usually will do vitamin supplementation if we've done blood work and we find that individuals are low. And the most common vitamin that we find that individuals are low is vitamin D. Right. So vitamin D is low and so uh, we're enc encouraging people to get outside and get their sunshine. Um, right, and getting it from that standpoint, but we also get individuals that come to us from the northern climes, and uh, you know, northern Michigan, and there's snow on the ground for seven months, and you only have five months where it's not, and it's pretty cold, and so on and so forth, and there's questions about if you're darker skinned and you're above a certain latitude, whether you can actually get a sufficient amount of sunshine in order to produce a sufficient amount of vitamin D, and so we are supplementing from that standpoint, or individuals that come and they're B12 deficient, or they have high homocysteine levels, and the cofactors that are involved in homocysteine's metabolism is your B vitamins, B12, B9, and B6. And so if homocysteine levels are high, which is associated with cardiovascular disease, certain cancers, and uh, dementia, uh, then we'd be giving somebody like a B complex from that. But I'm not a fan of just vitamins, right? just a daily vitamin. If we find that there's deficiency, yes. Or if there's a specific case where, where we know that there's uh, research that shows that a particular vitamin might be beneficial in this particular case, yes. Now as far as supplements are concerned, and the question of uh, since there's not uh, you know, FDA regulation for supplements and manufacturing and that kind of stuff, who can you trust and what can you trust? That's a really good question, and I don't have a really good answer to it. Uh, it's, very, it's very real that there are problems associated with it. In fact, um, I think it was two months ago that I was reading a study uh, that had come out recently uh, in regards to supplementation and looking at, they were looking at 25 different companies that produce herbal products and they were producing an herb. Right? It was supposed to be an herb and it was supposed to be at a concentration and so on and so forth. And what, and then so they did the, whatever the studies that they have to do, you know, chromatography and, and that kind of stuff to identify what actually is in there. And they found that in a majority of the, the um, well, in several of the companies, there was not a single piece of the herb that they claimed that was in the thing. It wasn't there. It was actually filler, and it was maybe a little bits of another herb. Some of them were what you might consider honest mistakes. Uh, and what they thought they had was this genus with this species, but they actually got this genus with the different species. And they look very similar physically, and so it's difficult to tease them apart until you start getting to the molecular you know, level, and so then you can figure it out from that standpoint. And so you had some that were substitutions from that standpoint. And of the 25, I think there were four that actually had all of what they said that they were that was there without a filler and without some other kind of stuff mixed in it or having things from that standpoint. So it's a real issue. And what the study doesn't tell you is which 25 companies they studied and which ones had which. They don't list it at all in the paper. You go through and you read it and all of it, they, they don't tell you. Um, so I'm still waiting, right? um, because I want to know too, you know? 
I mean, yeah, we can get the herbs, we can grow the herbs, and we can do that kind of stuff, and that we can be more confident from, you know, from that standpoint. And and when it's a cut and sift, and you can look at it, and you can go, oh well, yeah, that's, you know, that's, well, hey, that's dandelion root. I know that. That's turmeric root. Yeah, I know that. And you can smell it, and you can go, okay, well, yeah, that smells like this herb, and I know it. You can know from that standpoint, but when you start getting to capsules and powders and other things like that, then you don't, you don't know. Yes, you know. So I don't have a really good answer from that standpoint. I just to to to, to reiterate that yes, it's a problem. It is. Did you have another question? Well, I guess it's a follow-up question because usually, um, you know, you, you don't really know where your weaknesses are until you are tested. But what I've come to find is I'm not really sure where to even if you're not really having any symptoms or problems and you just want a baseline for, you know, am I doing okay? Are my levels okay? It's kind of hard to, to know where to get that. Right. And, and, and for it to be affordable mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah. And I know with the supplements, you know, you can go get a, a cheap turmeric, mm -hmm. but you don't know if it's actually potent or, you know, right. you could pay four times what you could get for one and then you still don't really know. Right. <laughs> So, That's um, true. But I guess you offer blood testing. Yes. And mm -hmm. you know, a full health panel, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and in fact, that's one of the uh, one of the giveaways for mm -hmm. uh, for the weekend mm -hmm. for whoever gets the the lucky draw. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And we should always, you know, because we thought that was greater than just, you know, the blood, the urine, the this, the that. We take the hair analysis. Right. You don't find a lot of people doing that. No, there's not a lot of labs that do. Years ago, right. I had great labs that I was working uh -huh. on, helping people lose weight and do things that feel better. Right. Yeah, there's still labs that do it. Great Plains uh, Laboratories does hair analysis. Uh, Genova Diagnostics has uh, hair analysis as well. Uh, if we're doing a hair analysis, we're usually doing it for heavy metals. Uh, that's usually what we're looking for when we're doing a hair analysis. Um, but even that, I'm, I'm a little bit leery. Why? Because I've run into others who have tested it and what they did is they took one person's hair samples and they sent it to 13 labs. And they got 13 results. Yeah. So, yeah, all different. <clears throat> and, um, and so I, I question that. We used to use a lab for uh, food allergies. Um, and it was doing, uh, you know, food allergy testing. It was fairly expensive. Um, but I had my questions about it because when we would cut, we would, when we would identify what the food allergies were and we would cut those out, about 50% of individuals did well, and the other 50% of the individuals didn't seem to make a difference. And so for a 50-50, for $450, I was thinking, well, I don't know. Is it really worth it? And what's really going on? Is it, is it valid? So recently, <clears throat> we got one person's sample and we sent it under two different names. And, uh, and, um, and we sent it at the same time, and we came back with two separately, significantly different results from the same blood sample. We don't use the lab anymore. Right? <clears throat> um, and I'm not sure exactly where to go right now as far as uh, you know, food allergy uh, testing and, and whatever, but I'm, I'm leery. I know we can trust the regular lab. Right, you know, and doing sodiums and potassiums and, and cholesterol levels and other things like that. You know, the basics. I know that that we can trust those because they're 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 fairly standardized, they're regulated, and so on and so forth. And so that's a lot of what we do uh, with the testing. But there's there's a lot out there that you can't uh, necessarily trust. <clears throat>